Great pleasure to welcome Rob Paddock to What's Next. Rob is the CEO at Valentia Institute and the co-founder of Get Smarter. Uh, Rob, firstly, good morning to you. Welcome to you. Thank you for joining us on What's Next. How's it going? I mean, it must have been a very interesting last two years with COVID-19 and being in the education space. It, it certainly has been. And thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I think the, the world has changed significantly over the last two, two and a half years. And whilst in some ways we're coming out off the back end of this COVID pandemic and we're seeing a retu retu return to normality, I think what's interesting is that once the genie's out the box, you can't necessarily put it back in. <laughs> so, so certainly in the, in, as it relates to education, we're seeing a, some fairly seismic shifts towards the integration of technology, more learners realizing that online can be a, a good modality for them. But we're also having very plain conversations around what works and what doesn't work in online education and in education technology and I think that's an important point to make there's no there's no silver bullets here there's no there's no panacea that is kind of uh, tech is always yes, good yes. There, there are things about technology that are incredibly enabling and good and there's some some that are very problematic and we need to keep working very hard to to mitigate well I mean Rob let's unpack that I mean when you look at online I mean Online learning is nothing new, right? And I think we've been perfecting it and perfecting it over the last, uh, over a decade, actually. And when you look at the biggest benefits of online learning compared to doing these things in person, what, what would you say those things are? I mean, I guess there's a, there's a few, uh, a, a couple that spring to mind immediately are the, the increased flexibility that comes with the ability to not only personalize a learning experience, but allow learners, no matter where they are, to actually continue learning from wherever they are. And, you know, so much, so, so much, um, so much of, let's say, intellectual development has been, has been contingent on the fact that, that people need to be geographically clustered together historically. And that means if you live in a yeah. rural area and you want to access incredible minds at a university or at a school, you just don't necessarily have that. That, that opportunity. And I would say this is one of the great, great leaps forward in education is that technology builds a bridge between learners and, and, and teachers regardless of where they are respectively geographically located. And that's a very, very big, big deal as it relates to, to empowering a future generation who can come from all, all corners of South Africa and indeed the globe. Um, I think the other thing that I feel is really exciting about education technology is that it's starting to take on a, this kind of bundled role of a teacher that they have historically played, which is actually a very complex, very cumbersome role. It, with the effective deployment of education te technology, that can actually take quite a lot of the burden and the load off teachers over time. And this is one of my our great obsessions at the Valencia Institute is how can we get tech to do the things that tech does best and, and start to relieve the very burdensome role that teachers have historically played? Because in my estimation, we aren't going to make it right now. We have this bulging youth population. We have a shrinking teacher population. And if we don't create mechanisms and enabling environments that allow less teachers to serve more learners, we've got a very big problem in our country. Okay. And I guess there, there are so many common myths, right, that you must hear about online learning. I mean, the, the concentration, the productivity, as you imagine you hear, all these kind of things. What is the reality about these online, about these myths that you hear all the time? Can you dispel them for us? Well, I guess what, the first myth, um, and, and let me say this as, a, as someone who is a bit of a tech evangelist, but, but tech isn't, isn't always good. More technology is not always the, the answer. And I think that when we look at education, we look at online education and ed tech generally, we need to consider it very specifically by phase of development. So, you know, the, how we think about the deployment and the integration of technology needs to be completely different when you're talking about early childhood development. As as, as compared to pro ongoing professional development of people who are in the workplace looking to upskill themselves. Very, very different right. propositions, very different developmental stage and very different needs actually that, that need to be met through, through, through online or ed tech. Um, so I guess the first myth is, is more tech is not always better, certainly not. I guess the second myth is that, is that, um, is that online learning means lonely, online learning means you, means you in a computer. Uh, for, uh, perhaps at one point in, in, in the past it was true that e-learning was kind of synonymous with like this kind of like asynchronous tech process that you would it was you in the computer and that was it what what certainly is the case now for the vast majority of ed tech is that it's actually about the convergence between people and technology where again you've got tech doing some of the roles that that people historically had done um, but that you're now saving right. press and freeing up precious 
human time so that they can focus more on things that tech doesn't do well, like one-to-one remediation, like small group tutoring, like uh, like group-based project work facilitation, et cetera, et cetera. And that, I think, is such an exciting leap forward in terms of the way that we think about e- education more broadly. Um, and I guess that, that really speaks to the, to the next myth, which is that, which is that, which is that you know, online learning is lonely. Um, online learning does not need to be lonely if it's purpose if it's purpose built from the ground up and you purposefully introduce um, human connection groups societies clubs etc into the learning process yes it's now happening largely virtually but you know even at the UCT online high school we we are about to deploy the the the, the meetup app which is allowing parents to self-organize who are located in similar similar regions self-organize to have those in-person experiences and meetups and and play dates and so on um, so th- there's really interesting ways about thinking about this increasing blend between in-person and and, and digital that I'm, I'm really excited about no, oh, it's fascinating stuff. When you look at the challenges that uh, at online facing, that online learning faces, for example, when you look at high schools and tertiary educations, both locally and worldwide, and one of the things that I've picked in, in South Africa, especially when it comes to university students, is, uh, is connectivity in our mm. country. I think that still is a barrier. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's the trend you're picking up. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is a foundational barrier to, to creating more, let's call it, digital equity in our country, is connectivity and access to the appropriate hard, hardware and software. Um, I, I would say if we, had to, if we had to future cast and say what is, what is the, 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 let's say, the, the decreasing challenge over time, I would say that cost of cost of internet connectivity is coming down. Cost of access to the relevant computers, be they be their laptops or, or desktop devices, is coming down over time. Um, proliferation of alternative means of is securely powering uh, and providing electricity ca- coming down. So all of these, I think, are are challenges right now that we cannot dismiss, but that over time will cer- certainly be, be mitigated. So at least from my perspective, whilst they are challenges, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be forging ahead and starting to open up the additional affordances that, that, that online le- learning can, can make available. But right now, if you don't have access to in- internet or a laptop computer and so on, it's very difficult to meaningfully participate in, in, in online learning. So that would be that would be one foundational element that I that that, that I would that I would suggest. Um, I guess that mm-hmm. I mean there's a, there's a lot of other challenges with with online more broadly. I think there is. Um, as it relates to education institutions, it is actually quite a different set of skills and a bunch of new skills and organizational structures that need to be changed in order to effectively deliver online education. I think one of the things that we saw from the pandemic was that just expecting that people who have been lecturing in a lecture theater for 30 years to suddenly magically transition that online and that it's going to be a highly engaging, enriching experience is is, is a stretch. Um, this is a, this is a okay. new set of skills which have some overlap with traditional teaching, but which you actually need to fundamentally rethink your organizational structure your your the, the competencies and the skills that you have in house to deliver to deliver this effectively so i think there is a there is let's call it a kind of a, a skills and a organizational structure piece within the existing education institutions that needs to evolve in response to 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 online and then finally i would say there's still okay. a legislative piece which is that a lot of our education um, legislation hasn't yet caught up to the new realities that, that technology is providing in, in the education space. Um, and I think that that's something that government officials are working very hard on, but it's, you know, I mean, uh, education and technology is not the only field. The same thing with things like cryptocurrencies and so on. It's like these, th- these, these innovations are happening so fast that it's hard for the regulators to actually keep up. Um, and so that means there's this kind of regulatory lag behind what the market is moving towards and what providers are actually, are actually delivering on. And that, of, of course, causes t- tension that needs to be resolved. Yeah, it's it's actually quite fascinating, and it almost talks to there needs to be this mind shift, right, uh, and, and re look at education completely differently because, like everything else, it's evolved. Yeah. And when you look at the current state of online uh, in in South Africa, online learning and the industry, uh, it it must have grown significantly uh, since the uh, pandemic started. Um, h- how much? Do you think it can grow in, into the future? How much growth have we seen, firstly, in the last two years, and what are the future trends that you spotting? Yeah, I, th- I think we're I think we're right at the beginning of, of an exponential gro- growth curve. So I do think that that co- the COVID pandemic certainly, um, let's say, accelerated that, that that process for a period of time. Um, and again, I think I started with this, but you know, the genie's out the bottle, and for a lot of learners, they've realised that there's alternative access points and different modalities of learning that are actually more preferable for them. And to be clear, I don't think online yeah. education could be or should be for everyone. Equally, I don't think that residential education could be or should be for everyone. 
everyone. And what I'm really encouraged by is the fact that there's increasing diversity of choice for learners. And you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm sure, sure you've got kids. If you've got more than one child, you'll know how even with the same environment from the, with the same gene from the same gene pool and so on, just how different two kids in your own house can be. And the idea that most kids are, are, are regardless of the wide variety of differences they have, are being schooled in pretty much exactly the same way across our country, I think is a is a very big invitation for alternative provisions and, and, and new modalities. Um, I guess to answer your question more directly, there's been exponential growth. Um, when we started, we were the, we were one of two online schools in South Africa. There's now 32 online schools in South Africa alone. So I think that wow. gives you a sense of the kind of exponential growth just in terms of providers in response to the demand. Um, we yeah. m most recently partnered with the University of Cape Town to launch the UCT online high school uh, that we launched in July of, 20, uh, of 2021. Um, we received over 12,900 applications to join the school. We actually couldn't grow fast enough to, 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 uh, to allow all of, those, all of those applications in. So we've allowed 5,000 in and we'll incrementally be unlocking more places as, as the year goes on and as we can capacitate ourselves with the right teachers and, su and support coaches and so on. But there is a... There is a exponentially increasing demand for quality alternative um, schooling modalities such as online. That's insane. You know, Rob, I was just thinking as you were talking and looking at this growth that you're experiencing and you were just talking about the different models. I mean, when you look at work, for example, a lot of people talk about this, this hybrid model. Do you think a hybrid model can work alongside an online platform with an education point of view. And I'm automatically thinking about physics, for yeah. example, and, you know, being in class physically to see an experiment. Um, and then I guess you can, you know, if you've got a physical structure of a school, you can kind of alternate kids on a Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Wednesday. I mean, is a hybrid model a reality when it comes to online learning? It, it, it is and it is already. Um, so we've got a number of projects which we call either boutique campuses or micro schools where learners are still coming to a physical space where, and they look very much like kind of co-working spaces. Um, but all of their teaching and learning is taking place online with support from teachers around the country, uh, using the affordances of education technology, etc. But they're coming to a physical space, which means that they have yeah. the opportunities for socialization, excuse me, extracurricular, and to your point, can engage in some of the areas where online technologies aren't yet up to scratch. And there are virtual lab simulations and so on, which are good, but the actual practical experience of working in a lab is, is, is of course, very different and very, very beneficial. Um, so we're certainly seeing that. Okay. We have a really great project uh, with the Western Cape Education Department in Mitchell's Plain in a very challenged area where we've seen learners in a, a blended learning micro school um, make make an average grade level leap of three years in, in, in one academic year with us, which is just huge in terms of the, the, the implications sure. and we're able to run this at a cost that is very similar to what the what the government is currently spending per, per learner per year. So I think it, it is it is high time that we start to introduce new possibilities and and particularly for the more vulnerable po portion of our population I believe that blended learning has to be the solution. I don't think if you uh, I mean as an example if you don't have an enabling home environment and mom and dad are fighting and or there's substance abuse within within the home one of the functions that schools perform for children is acting as a safe harbor from the very harsh realities that they experience at home. So just expecting that they could study right. completely online from home is not necessarily realistic for, for many people in our population. But the idea of blending the best of what technology can do with the safety of physical space and the reliable internet connectivity infrastructure, etc., is something that we believe in very, very strongly. And here's the best part. Now you don't need to spend 120 to 160 million rand to build new schools. You can take existing infrastructure and repurpose it for, well, exactly. for, for blended learning. And that our school in Mitchell's Plain is a repurpose storeroom and you think to yourself well jeepers what, what, ha what happens if we think differently about the deployment of capital expenditure in, 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 in our Department of Basic Education budget and we're no longer looking at building new schools but actually repurposing existing infrastructure and making sure that it's kitted out with the appropriate technology so that learners can engage in blended learning. Jeez, what an exciting space. I mean Rob you're the CEO of Volunteer Institute could you please tell us more about this particular organization? And I'm very curious as to how you came up with the name Valentur. <laughs> sure. well, am I pronouncing it correct? Yeah, pr pretty close. So it's actually a portmanteau of, of uh, valiant and adventure. Um, 
and it's actually a a a um, the name uh, my 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 chancellor who sadly now has has passed away um, came came up with the name and his his view and he was a, a, an incredible uh, professor at Harvard University launched all of their big big um, edtech initiatives and and MOOC MOOC platforms and so on, um, but he he's often he's always been of the opinion that education really is it's this combination of both this this need to be brave and to valiantly move forward but it's an adventure you know <laughs> like it's it's something that should be exploratory and should be stimulating and and should be can keep you on the edge of your seat um, so it's effectively a portmanteau of valiant and adventure and that's and that's that's where Valencia um, comes from Valencia yeah. Valencia exactly Valencia is that right <laughs> exactly right I love it I love the name it's such a cool name oh, thank you um, so so that that's where the name comes from um, so Valencia Institute is a is a so, social impact focused global education technology business um, our mission is to transform physical limitations into digital education opportunities and what we the, the way that we do that is we we partner with these incredible education institutions such as St. Stithians, such as the University of Cape Town, to, to launch and offer online school opportunities. Um, so we have two, two main offerings at the moment, both with St. Stithians and UCT, and very shortly we'll be announcing a new partnership with a, with a major UK, UK institution as well. Um, our focus is exclusively on emerging economies. With the UCT Online High School, our offering is available at just 2,000 Rand a month, which makes us one of the most pri uh, affordable private schools in the country. Um, and again, our, our mission and our mandate is to make sure that we take what has historically been seen as, as, as um, uh, uh, communities with, with less opportunity and making sure that we transform that into, into education opportunities. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned just now that uh, Valencia uh, Institute has partnered with St. Stidians, mm. which of course is one of the most prestigious schools in South mm. Africa with uh, the St. Stidians Online High School. Could you explain why this particular online high school is superior and, and the Valencia Institute uh, contributing to this elite experience? How does it all blend in? Can you expand on what you touched on yeah, earlier? Yeah, so this, this is very much a partnership between us as an education technology company as well as the as well as Synstithians who are, to your point, one of the most most highly ranked and highly respected school, schools on, on in the country. Um, it is it is truly a case of teamwork making the dream work, where we're making sure that we're bringing in the best of Synstithians' expertise and experience in the domain of delivering secondary education, um, and the best of Valencia's expertise in providing the appropriate student support and education technology to provide a rich and engaging online learning experience. So it's very much a collaboration. We have a shared governance structure that we work to, that we work on together. Um, there's shared decision making, and then and then the delivery takes place in, in combination, largely by Valencia, but with strong oversight and governance from from St. Stidians. Um, so that is a school that is offering a British curriculum um, to learn, learners around South Africa. Um, it is a combination of live classes as well as as well as um, asynchronous edtech led, led learning. Um, and we also have, with St. Stidians, these, these boutique campuses, both in Cape Town and, and Johannesburg, where learners can actually come to the uh, physical space um, and, uh, and participate in their, in their um, online learning, but then still have all the benefits of socialization and um, being looked after by adults during the day so that the kids, their parents can continue to work and so on and so on. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful partnership. That's fantastic. Now, the Valencia Institute is also deeply involved in the, on the, in the UCT online high school. You were talking about that earlier, which is an affordable online school run by the UCT. Um, I mean, what, what role does the Valencia Institute play in providing the top quality high school education that we've been talking about uh, and, and really making it more available and I show you yeah. know, more expandable to more South Africans. Yeah. Uh, it, it is very similar to, to what I just described with St. Stidians where we have a shared governance structure where there's shared oversight. Um, UCT certainly takes the lead in terms of in terms of what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, but we, we integrate as an education technology partner and as a business that has that has a very very well established and mature student support suite of student support services. Um, so I, with UCT, it's really interesting as well because it's a university. Um, there's strong quality assurance and oversight from 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 the university. We have faculty members who are doing guest lecture series for for our students. Um, we integrate with the career services office, with the admissions office, and so on. So there's this really interesting bridge between secondary and tertiary schooling. That that, that we're creating, which I'm really excited about. And I, I guess this comes from a bit of a, a philosophical belief that I don't, 
there, there are these really strong disjoints between different sectors of our education mm. system, between junior and high, between high and tertiary. There are these very yeah. these steep kind of drop-offs, and we need more integration between the different sectors. And I think this is one of the things that we're doing at the UCT Online High School, is that we're creating more of a seamless pathway between um, secondary and tertiary. Fantastic. Now, you're also the co-founder of Get Smarter. What does Get Smarter do? How does that fit into the picture? Yeah, so Get Smarter is an online um, education company that works with the world's leading universities to deliver online short courses to working professionals. So these will typically be, be about eight to ten week programs. Uh, we partner with universities such as UCT, Oxford, uh, Cambridge, uh, Harvard, Stanford, um, uh, MIT, many more. And they, we, we partner together with them, we work with their faculty to develop these online courses that we then d deliver and that then our students are issued a certificate from, from the university itself. Um, it's a business that my brother Sam and I started in 2007, uh, late 2006, early 2007. Um, we built that up over, over the 10 years that followed. We ended up actually selling that business to a NASDAQ listed business called 2U. Um, by the time we finished up, um, we'd educated just over 200,000 learners from 150. 54 countries around the world. Um, and it was a wonderful wow. experience of, of, of delivering quality education at scale. Um, so I'm no longer operationally involved by, in, in the business. The business is the, the, the owner of the business now is 2U, which is a global ed tech education technology company. Um, but the business continues to go from strength to strength, and it's really been wonderful to, to continue to see its growth trajectory. Fantastic. What an exciting space you're working on. Um, Rob, what, are, what, are Valencia, what is the Valencia Institute and Get Smarter Future Plans? Where do you want to take that? I imagine you want to pro possibly even reduce the cost of education even further, um, but your plans I'm blown away by what you're doing now. I'd love to hear what you're planning for the future. Yeah, thank you. And I can't speak to Get Smarter's future just because I'm no longer involved in the, in the leadership team, but I can tell you that there's some very exciting things com coming up for that business. Um, I can certainly comment on, on Valencia's future. We are, we are fastidiously focused on serving the underserved um, and making sure that we're creating, creating opportunities for learners in emerging economies where they have been currently stuck between a rock and, rock and a hard place. Um, uh, in terms of future prospects, I mentioned earlier that we, in the not too distant future, will be announcing a very exciting partnership with a top, top, top UK institution. Um, and the, the focus of, of that work is going to be largely on serving learners in West and East Africa. Um, we are working really, really hard to make sure that we continue to, to advance our technology so that we can integrate what's called AI-driven adaptive learning. So artificial intelligence-driven adaptive learning, which for me is the really exciting new frontier of, of education technology. And what this refers to is the fact that as, a, as would be the case with a great teacher who's working one-on-one -on -one with a student, the, this is actually a, co a, a conversation that where there's adaptation that's taking place in real time from the teacher where they are venturing new, 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 new thoughts, ideas, where they are getting, seeing where the learner is landing in terms of their understanding of content and then is adapting their instructional and assessment strategies in real time. And I think this is something that we all are so, so familiar with when it comes to face-to-face -face interaction and, and kind of face-to-face -face teaching mm. uh, where, where we've experienced great teachers, but technology can play a huge role in that, where you can actually truly personalize the learning for every single, every single student. And that is something that I'm extremely excited about and something that we're putting a lot of time and energy into, into figuring out how we can make very, very big leap, leapfrogs in, in that domain. Well, wow, Rob, um, I'm really, really impressed with what you guys are doing, and I'm looking forward to uh, watching your journey. You. Uh, Rob Paddock, who's the CEO at Valencia Institute and the co-founder of Get Smarter. Rob, thank you for sharing the insights with us, and uh, what an exciting uh, space to work in. And, um, and also, I mean, it must be incredibly rewarding. You know, I wanted to ask you if there's any kind of... Um, uh, insights in, and, and, and actually stats and data that shows that um, people who do online tuition and online studying are getting higher grades than being at school. Is there such a comparison that, you know, are you finding that people who are online focus more get higher grades or, or, or is it the same as being in a school classroom? Yeah, you know, what's so interesting is that is that online is not online is not online. And what I mean by that is that is that in the same way that, you know, saying uh, how effective is residential education? It's actually a question that's almost impossible to answer because you actually need to get down to the level of granularity is re residential education at which school? 
and with, with which students and with what kind of socioeconomic context that they find themselves in and so on and so on. So, so right. um, and, and there's such a range of online providers. Some online providers are basically school over Zoom. Um, other, other online providers like us are a really interesting intersection between education technology and humans and leveraging artificial intelligence and so on. Um, and so it's quite dif difficult to make a baseline comparison uh, across the board. But what I can tell you is that in our context, we have learners in Mitchell's Plain who we've seen jump an average of three grade levels in one year through the blended learning micro school that we're running in, in, in collaboration with the Western Cape Education Department. Wow. That is simply unheard of in terms of in terms of academic gain in a year. Um, so so there are there, there, there is incredible promise that's being shown, but like anything, it's a very specific discipline that needs a lot of time and energy and refinement that needs to continue to take place. So we certainly don't pretend to be perfect. We're far from it. But jeepers, that where where we're where we're very excited is is that we see great promise, um, and we see that this great promise can lead to actually increasing the quality of, of learning and decreasing the cost, and that's something that as a country we have to be focused on. Rob, so good chatting to you. Rob Paddock, CEO at Valencia Institute, co-founder of Get Smarter. Thank you for your time and thank you for joining us on uh, what's next and sharing those insights with thank us. Thank you so much. Wishing you all the best in the future. Really Thanks, appreciate Rob. it. Take care. Thanks so much.